particularly for Christians, Muslims, Sikhs, everybody else, it is educative and deeply involving to read the reports of the proceedings of the subcommittees on minorities and depressed classes. Once you go through it, you realize how great was the knowledge of those who were there. This debate was taking place even as partition was taking place in a way. Delhi was, there were rivers of blood flowing here, and there were rivers of blood flowing in Calcutta and many other cities. And well, during those days, of course, there was no discussion. But in the aftermath of that bloodshed, the discussion was peaceful, reasoned, compassionate. People who spoke, and these were people who were as high bound, as fundamentalist, as obscurantist, as orthodox, as any that you can find today. But they were still of an old kind, open minded. They could see and listen to the other side. And that is what comes through in the constituent assembly debates, subcommittee debates on minority affairs. And that is something I always go back to take courage when we find parliament today, courts today, not exactly reasoned, not exactly neutral, not exactly occasionally, not exactly even sane. So this seminar for us as a 101-year-old institution which has seen that event and some of our friends were there is, is something that is an opportunity to once again delve deep and drink deep of the well that we were speaking of a few minutes ago. It is a good fortune that in this webinar we have some excellent luminaries, exponents of the law and more than that, exponents of the secular fabric of this country, in their lives, in their vision, in their speeches, in their writings, in what they say in front of courts, what they say on camera, they say those things fearlessly. When we are introducing them, I'll go a little more into who they are. But at the moment, it's my unique privilege and pleasure to invite the president of the All India Catholic Union to address us with his opening remarks. It is also one of the few seminars we will, we don't open with a traditional speech by some presiding bishop of some committee of the Catholic Bishops Conference. The one friend bishop we have will speak in his capacity as a participant and a person who believes in the Constitution. Uh, Mr. Lancy D'Souza is, uh, Lancy Tikuna, I beg your pardon, is the current president of the College of Catholic Union. He is from Mangalore. The beard is transient. When we knew him, when we elected him, he had no beard. But <laughs> believe you me, he's the same man who I now invite to address us with his opening remarks. Respected Dr. John Dayal, today's moderator, Most Reverend Bishop Theodore Muscarenas, Rebecca John, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India, Natasha Badwar, author, filmmaker, and activist, Advocate Rafael de Souza, President of BCS, my dear colleagues in AICU, and respectful participants. Welcome you all for this webinar on defending constitutional rights organized by All India Catholic Union. A young friend, a lawyer in Odisha, reminded us this morning of the role of community played as a part of freedom struggle and from there in the constituent assembly in framing the constitution which was adopted this day in 1949. Mr. Narendra Mukherjee, a Bengali Christian, was the vice president of the constituent assembly which drafted the constitution. Mr. Mukherjee was also the chairman of minority committee which drew up the important guarantees which protect minority rights. The other members of the community included Frank Anthony, Jaipal Singh Manda, John Matai, Reverend Jerome de Souza, S. H. Pratap, James Wilson, Joseph Alban de Souza, J. J. M. Nicholas Roy, and P. T. Chaco. J.J.M. Nicholas Roy was 
one of the architect of the sixth schedule of the Indian Constitution, which resulted in the establishment of autonomous district councils. Jerome de Souza ensured the rights of the minorities, especially of worship and education, were fully protected by the proposed tax and rights of the practice and propagate one's religion were included in the constitution as as a member of the constitutional assembly of india tribal christian jaypal singh munda campaigned for the rights of the old tribal community he was a part of the three committees including advisory committee in celebrating this day we also pay homage to them the younger generation must know this and be proud of their participation the aicu webinar hopefully will remind us also of how to preserve and save this constitution from erosion and from distraction <coughs> without taking much time i welcome you all and request the moderator dr john dayal to continue this webinar thank you thank you anand Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for that reminder that we did indeed play a role in the framing of this constitution. And this is a good reply which we can give to people who think that we are an appendage of the Raj, that we didn't participate in the freedom struggle, which is another seminar in which we'll understand how deeply our South Indian Christians in particular, Goan Christians and others involved in the freedom struggle of India. Uh, with that preface that the President has given, it is my pleasure and privilege and honor to invite Rebecca Mammon John to address us. By way of introduction, when she's an old friend, so I asked her would she participate in this? She says, Oh, good Lord, uh, it's a working day. And for us, it's so hectic because the courts are partly open and partly virtual. And I participate, I've got a, a, a room in my office which is safe, secure, and, and sanitized. And then I sort of rush, shuttle between them. I come home, have a quick shower, and this is about the time I'm just settling down to prepare for tomorrow's hectic day in courts with my clients. And uh, I didn't go down on my knees and plead with her, but she was kind enough to say, okay, they have asked, the catechism is important, I'll be there for half an hour. But after that, it was released, and I said, surely, I'm gonna, I am a man of my word. Rebecca, as we know, is a friend of the persecuted church. She is a friend of all those who approach her for help, all women in trouble who approach us, and she is currently fighting for the right of women to say no. Howsoever powerful is the man who is trying to paw them or, or, or do whatever ugly things that men do when they are drunk with power or just drunk. I will not go into the case. I don't know if Rebecca would want me to, but she is free, of course, to refer to it. But also important is Rebecca has been involved in the justice process of Kandamal, the right of the seven accused who are in jail for longer terms than actual murderers are, 10 years without bail. And we had approached her for that. And she is constantly my counsel on issues of persecution whenever I'm in doubt or I need help or I just need moral support. I know who to phone up, which basement to go in defense colony and meet her face to face and uh, so on and so forth. Rebecca is, as I said, a friend of the persecuted, a friend of the underdog. As an officer of the court, she has reminded judges of where they get off and where others would transgress the rights of the defenseless get off. Rebecca, 25 to 30 minutes, or as long as you wish, whichever is more. Thank you so much, John. That was such a lovely introduction. I don't know whether I deserve those kind words, but thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm delighted to be with all of you today and to speak on the occasion of Constitution Day. This has been an unprecedented year, and we live in unusual and difficult times. It is in such times that the celebration of our Constitution and the struggle that gave us this foundational document and its promise has become more significant than ever. 
The Constitution of India was drafted in the aftermath of an intense and bitterly fought freedom struggle against a colonial power. Arbitrary arrests, preventive retention, farcical trials were routinely and systematically used by the British in India to stifle dissent and imprison leaders of the freedom movement. Mahatma Gandhi was the editor and publisher of a weekly journal named Young India. Between 15th June 1921 to 23rd February 1922, Mahatma Gandhi published four articles titled Disaffection, a Virtue, Tampering with Loyalty, The Puzzle and its Solution, and Shaking the Mains. The sanction to prosecute under Section 124A of the Indian Penal Code, Sedition, was issued with respect to these four articles, and during trial, the Advocate General contended that the offending articles were part of an organized campaign to harm the government. Gandhi pleaded guilty to the charge of sedition and said, and I quote, Section 124A under which I am happily charged is perhaps the prince among the political sections of the Indian Penal Code designed to suppress the liberty of the citizen. Affection cannot be measured or regulated by law. If one, has the, if one has no affection for a person or system, one should be free to give the fullest expression to his disaffection, so long as he does not contemplate, promote, or incite violence. But the section under which Mr. Banker and I are charged is one under which mere promotion of disaffection is a crime. I have studied some of the cases tried under it, and I know that some of the most loved of India's patriots have been convicted under it. I consider it a privilege, therefore, to be charged under such, such a section. I have no personal ill will against any single administrator, much less can I have any disaffection towards the king's person. But I hold it to be a virtue to be disaffected towards a government which is in its totality has done more harm to India than any previous system. India is less manly under the British rule than she was before. Holding such a belief, I consider it to be a sin to have affection for the system. And it has been a precious privilege for me to be able to write that I have in the various articles tendered in evidence against me." Unquote. Gandhi was convicted and made to undergo a sentence of six years. Despite the Supreme Court of Independent India repeatedly emphasizing that Section 124A of the IPC can be invoked only if there's a direct incitement to violence, this law is routinely used to curb a citizen's fundamental right to free speech guaranteed under Article 19 of the Constitution. A blanket labeling of dissent as anti-national or anti-democratic strikes at the heart of the country's commitment to protect constitutional values and promote deliberative democracy. The destruction of space for questioning and dissent destroys the basis of all growth, political, economic, cultural, and social. A head, headmistress of a school in Karnataka, along with a parent of a child, were arrested on grounds of sedition and kept in jail for nearly 15 days for staging a play that challenged the enactment of the Citizenship Amendment Act earlier this year. A man in Silchar was arrested for his Facebook post against the Prime Minister and kept in jail for a few days. Journalist Pr Prashant Kanojia was jailed for a sarcastic tweet made against the UP Chief Minister Yogi Adityanath. Why is speech today the most curbed fundamental right and the thinking, speaking, protesting Indian the new enemy of the state? With the increasing use of criminal law to clamp down on dissent, we can also see the shrinking of constitutional protections and individual rights and freedoms through the increasing number of laws passed, the creation of more and more offenses, harsher sentences for ex existing and newer offenses, and a near impossibility to get bail for offenses that the state perceives as dangerous. The last few years have been marked by incidents of violence, a concerted attack on minorities, incidents of gender and caste-based violence, the incarceration of activists, academics, and poets, and a closeness between the Supreme Court and the executive, the use of the law of contempt, and the selective nature of hearings before the Supreme Court, all of which has led to a weakening of the democratic structure. 
we celebrate Constitution Day in the shadow of the last few years. As a criminal lawyer practicing for the last 33 years, there have, there have been some events that have stood out as stark remi reminders that the promise of the Constitution is still a distant dream. The use of the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, UAPA, along with the charge of conspiracy against academics, intellectuals, lawyers, activists, and poets, has found its latest application in two large conspiracy cases in which trials are yet to begin, which have slowly widened their nets to capture new accused persons every few months. I refer to the Bhima Koregrau case and the Delhi riots case. On 28th August 2018, Sudha Bhardwaj, Gautam Navlakha, Arun Ferreira, Vernon Gonzalez, and Varavara Rao were arrested in the Bhima Koregaon case. They have been in jail pending trial for almost three years under the UAPA. In a more recent spate of arrests, the NIA saw it fit to arrest an 83-year-old Jesuit priest, Father Stan Swami, in the same case. The National Investigating Agency was recently granted 20 days time by a sessions court to respond to Father Stan's simple plea to be provided a sipper cup or straw in jail as he could not hold glasses easily because he suffers from Parkinson's disease. Today, a special NIA court in Mumbai directed the concerned medical officer in jail to reply to the requirements of a straw and a sipper after the NIA expressed its inability to provide the same to Father Stan Swami. Several activists were named and arrested in the Delhi riots case under the UAPA, including Khalid Sefi, whom I represent, Devangana Kalita, Natasha Narwal, Umar Khalid, and Safura Zangar. Many others have been named as accused and interrogated repeatedly and have yet to be arrested. Laws like the UAPA are meant to apply to exceptional situations. However, the increasing use of the law shows that the exception has become the norm and the safeguards and guarantees of criminal law are diluted by the hard expansion of state power to these laws. One example of the harshness of the UAPA lies in the time allotted for custody of an accused during the period of investigation. The Code of Criminal Procedure, which is the general law, allows for persons to be put in custody for a maximum period of 60 or 90 days within which the charge sheet has to be filed. Section 43D2 of the UAPA is in variance with the Code of Criminal Procedure and simply put, a single remand can now extend to 30 days instead of 15 days and the charge sheet ought to be filed within 90 days but can be extended to a period of 180 days. This act cannot and must not uh, pass the test of constitutionality. Unfortunately, no court has yet to the unconstitutional. Don't hold the back of it, please. Hold the base. The consequences of pretrial detention are clear. Ah, there's nothing in the base. Defendants presumed innocent are subjected to psychological and physical deprivations of jail life, usually under more onerous conditions that are imposed on convicted defendants. The jail defendant loses his job, if he has one, and is prevented from contributing to the preparation of his defense. Equally important, the burden of his detention frequently falls heavily on the innocent members of his family. Under the UAPA, obtaining bail is a virtual impossibility. Under Section 43D5 of the UAPA, a person accused of an offence under the Act, which is terror-related, cannot be released on bail. Court certifies that the allegations against him are prima facie false. This is a deviation from general law and makes the possibility of bail under UAPA a distant dream. The Unlawful Activities Prevention Act 1967 itself is vague and unconstitutional. It has the potential to criminalize those peaceful ideas, thought processes and actions that have no propensity to violence or to create public disorder 
or to disturb law and order. The UAPA takes us into a dark, shadowy world of banned organizations and fronts of banned organizations with its nebulous memberships and ambiguous associations, all based on loose language and loosely constructed enigmatic definitions that are open-ended, vague, and wholly unclear. It now gives the state the power to declare an individual a terrorist. And yet our courts have failed to address the issue of its unconstitutionality, its abject misuse, resulting in law consideration, often without any credible, believable, or cogent evidence. Statutes like the UAPA serve as a reminder that we are far away from the concept of constitutional morality and transformative constitution that the Supreme Court had so wonderfully enunciated in both the privacy and the 377 judgments. This month, a three-member bench of the Supreme Court, led by the Chief Justice, was hearing an Article 32 petition filed by a Kerala journalist who was arrested by the UP police at Hatras and charged under the UAPA. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of India thought it fit to remark, and I quote, we are trying to discourage Article 32 petitions. Of late, we find a spate of Article 32 petitions, unquote. There can be no occasion for the highest court of the, of the land to make such misplaced and unnecessary remarks. B. R. Ambedkar famously said in the Constituent Assembly debates that Article 32 is the heart and soul of the Constitution. It allows any citizen to move the highest court of the land to protect their fundamental rights against violations. Ambedkar said, and I quote, if I was asked to name any particular article in this constitution as the most important, an article without which this constitution would be a nullity, I could not refer to any other article except this one, Article 32. It is the very soul of the constitution and the very heart of it, unquote. In the Minerva Mills case, uh, it is a 1980 uh, Supreme Court case, Justice Bhagwati speaking for the bench held, and I quote, I pointed out in my judgment in that case, and I stand by it, that merely because the question has a political color, the court cannot fold its hands in despair and declare judicial hands off. So long as the question is whether an authority under the constitution has acted within the limits of its power or exceeded it, it can certainly be decided by the court. Indeed, it would be its constitutional obligation to do so. I have said before, I repeat again, the constitution is supreme, the paramount law of the land, and there is no department or branch of government above or beyond it. Every organ of the government, be it the executive or the legislature or the judici judiciary, derives its authority from the constitution, and it has to act within the limits of its authority, whether it was done so or not, is for the court to decide. The court is the ultimate interpreter of the Constitution, and when there is manifestly unauthorized exercise of power under the Constitution, it is the duty of the court to intervene. Let it not be forgotten that to this court, as much as to other branches of government, is committed, uh, is committed the conservation and furtherance of constitutional values. The court's task is to identify those values to constitutional plan and work them into life in the cases that reach the court. Tact and wise restraint ought to temper any power, but courage and the acceptance of responsibility have their place too. The court cannot and should not shirk its responsibility because it has sworn its allegiance to the Constitution of India and is also accountable to the people of this country. So when the Chief Justice of India made that comment, he perhaps forgot some of these landmark judgments that were passed earlier and before he took over as the Chief Justice of India. Article 32, therefore, breathes life into the Constitution, allowing us, the citizens of India, to move the highest constitutional court and demand from it the protection guaranteed to us under the Constitution. It is a refuge for the common person that makes the social contract between citizen and the state enforceable and acceptable. While the Chief Justice had claimed that the courts are discouraging petitions filed under Article 32, selective hearings for some have led bare <laughs> contradictions 
functioning of the court. Journalist Arnav Goswami was given was given bail at breakneck speed, complete with judicial observations about the importance of an individual's liberty. But habeas corpus petitions from Kashmir have languished for many months. An entire state is functioning in a pandemic without access to high-speed internet, crippling the rights of its residents to participate in normal social and economic activities. Petitions challenging electoral bond schemes are pending. And of course, several of our intel intellectual giants remain incarcerated. In addition to the process of dilution of rights through the courts, we have seen a recent attempt to change criminal laws of the country. On July 8th, 2020, a committee was set up under the AGs of the Home Ministry with an all-male upper caste five-member panel and was given the short time frame of six months within which it would submit its recommendations. I was a signatory to two letters of critique and concern addressed to the committee for criminal law reforms dated 8-7-2020 and 16-7-2020. This was also signed by former Supreme Court judges, High Court judges, senior advocates, advocates, bureaucrats, and academicians. Criminal laws embody the coercive power vested with the state against its citizens. The state defines offenses which are crimes against society. Since an offense is a crime against society, it is the responsibility and duty of the state to ensure that the offender is found, pro prosecuted and punished. A person accused of committing a criminal offense is faced with the might of the state machinery. Our collective experience has shown us that more often than not, the brunt of coercive criminal laws is borne by the most marginalized and vulnerable sections of our society, who are often not in a position to access quality legal representation or participate in the process of lawmaking. The coercive power of the state is also used against those who are ideologically different and those who dissent. As we speak, the Uttar Pradesh government has passed a draft ordinance ridiculously called Love Jihad that challenges the validity of interfaith marriages. It would be remiss of me to speak here without a reference to an incident that has shocked the nation. On September 14th, a 19-year-old Dalit woman was allegedly raped in the town of Hathras in Uttar Pradesh. Her neck was lacerated, her tongue gashed, and her vertebral column damaged on account of fracture on the sixth vertebrae. Her vaginal swab was reportedly taken 10 days after the incident, and a few days later she died in a hospital. In her in her dying declaration, the victim stated that she had been raped and was able to name and identify the perpetrators. She was cremated by the police in the most egregious fashion, egregious fashion, defying all established norms of decency, laws and dignity of the family. We are aware of the fact that the victim belonged to the landless Valmiki community, whereas the men named by her in her dying declaration were from the upper caste Thakur community. That dangerous caste divide determined some of the actions of the police in the days that followed. On the 1st of October, the investigating agency released statements to the press stating that there was no evidence to show that the young woman was raped because a vaginal swab, swab did not reveal the presence of SEMA. This over-reliance on medical and forensic evidence is deeply flawed. This is despite the fact that the 2013 amendments to the Indian Penal Code and Code of Criminal Procedure do not make the charge of rape dependent on the presence of semen. Following the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 2013, the definition of rape was amended to include offenses beyond penovaginal penetration. It includes penetration through an object or anything else into any sexual part of a woman's body, various forms of oral sex, or any other, fo any other form of forced act with another person. The wide ambit of the definition makes it incorrect to rely upon the presence or absence of semen in the victim's body, particularly when the swab was taken more than 10 days after the crime. The Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Guidelines for Medical Legal Care for Survivors clearly states, and I quote, the examining doctor should clarify in court 
that normal examination neither refutes nor confirms whether a sexual offence has occurred or not. This must ensure that a medical opinion cannot be given on whether rape occurred because rape is a legal term." Unquote. The investigating agency also seemed to have ignored the relevancy of the dying declaration made by the victim under Section 32 of the Indian Evidence Act. It failed in its understanding of the law and lapsed in its sole reliance on medical and forensic evidence, which has yet to be evaluated and placed before a court. It is a glaring example of the lacuna in the system. Can we ignore the reality that caste, religion, political interference, and biases do not give direction in the way we investigate crimes? Our constitution makers have lived through bitter years of struggle and seen an alien colonial power trampled over their human rights. And so while arming the government with powers to prevent anarchy from within, and from within and from and from from they took particular care to ensure that those powers were not used to mutilate the liberties of the people. In this last year, we have also, been, we've also seen terrible incidents of custodial violence, of state violence, during the pandemic and lockdown, mass migrations on a biblical scale of poor and marginalized workers, the use of war contempt and communal violence on a large scale. In these dark days, we have turned to for hope and succor when fundamental rights of the people are under threat. But as the Supreme Court opened its doors, to those who have suffered so much, perhaps not wide enough. The constitutional scheme is fundamentally sound, but can it withstand challenges thrown up by an increasingly insecure state? Can the idea of a deliberative democracy, an idea that is meant to combine political accountability with a high degree of reflect reflectiveness, be overrun by majoritarianism? Ram Malani one of this country's iconic criminal lawyers once wrote, and I quote, the greatest danger to the constitution and the rule of law does not come from a violent manifest blow. It is by gradual erosion, a little precipitation that freedom is usually and finally lost, unquote. The area where this onslaught is felt the most is criminal law. An individual who is arrested and is brought face to face with the powerful machinery of the state is at her most vulnerable. Criminal law interlinked with the constitution must place at its heart the individual and individual rights that guarantees her a fair trial, right to equal access to justice, right against self-incrimination and the right against erosion of her privacy. Fabrications are now commonplace in our trials, and they are unquestionably accepted. As true, society often hates those who are accused of crimes. And when this hatred becomes a call for revenge, it is easy to strip such persons of all their rights and say that the rights of the individual must give way to the collective conscience of the nation. But our constitution exists precisely to protect individuals against the collective cry of society. The judiciary and the executive must not work in sync. There must always be a degree of tension between the two. Judges must act without fear, favor, affection, or ill will. And as Gopal Subramaniam said earlier today in a lecture to Oxford University, without an independent judiciary, the constitution is little more than a statement of empty promises. In 1950, the system rested on hope, Mr. Subramaniam said, that the executive would do the right thing. 70 years on, the system rests on the hope that judges would do the right thing. In the midst of protests across the country at the end of last year and the beginning of this year, we saw the return of some hope, 
of the constitutional promise with dozens of young people and more especially women from all walks of life coming into the streets to stand together and read the preamble to our constitution affirming their faith in this document. We, the people of India, some of these brave people are in jail today. Today, as we celebrate Constitution, Constitution Day, I want to end by quoting Martin Luther King, who said, and I quote, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. The struggle to fulfill the promise of the Constitution is unfinished, and we must continue the struggle in courts and outside with hope. After all, our Constitution is nothing but a document of hope. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you very much for the third of fourth. And I'm so very glad I persevered with you till I wore down your reluctance to participate in today's seminar. I think that was, from a criminal lawyer's perspective, a look at all the crevices that the Constitution has, and yet all the defenses with which it covers the crevices. I think there is so much in what you said. I do hope you will share the text of your speech. So many of the lawyers here, there are very many of them, and some of the media could use them for, for all of us and for tomorrow's media. Uh, Rebecca has said she has to go back to her practice, uh, but I, I will still continue to pray that she stays back. But uh, meanwhile, after conveying to her a grateful thanks, uh, may I now call upon Natasha Patwar, another friend of ours, and Rebecca and she know each other. It will be remarkable women, these two. And uh, mm -hmm. as with both of them, I think all of us are a little bit yeah. in love with each one of them. <laughs> but I say that uh, from somebody who is uh, they have qualities that I would look for and hope for in my daughter and well, my sister is twice as old as they are, but people that we know, this erudition, this insight and the compassion. And that is also what Natasha brings to bear. She's my colleague in the Karawai Mahabharat. She is a filmmaker trained at the Jamia Milia's famous Hidwai Media Center, her short bits, her medium bits, and her long bits on what the Karawa has seen, what people have said about democracy, about the fragility of freedom itself, and the need to find hidden depths to defend it, are now celebrated. Please log into her thing or Karawa Mahabharat and see some of those things. They are remarkable from this very remarkable woman. She's an author. And we were intrigued when she named her first book from her column, which is My Daughter's Mum. I think this will be the first time I've ever read of a woman proud to, of her identity and seeking her identity from her children. And, and when you go through her columns, when you go through her books, when you talk to her, when she accompanies you on trips to 100 widows of 100 people killed, for the suspicion of carrying beef, for being suspected to be witches, for being suspects to be child lifters, for being just suspects, not even tried by a court of law. And you look into the eyes of those people, and then you look at Natasha's face when she is looking into the eyes of those people, then you know what it means to be what Jesus would have said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. For greater love hath no man. Uh, it is therefore a friend and a very loved friend at that that I introduce this remarkable woman, Natasha Badwar, to this remarkable audience of Catholics. You know, we are terrible people. We don't think anybody else is as good as us. But you're invited to join us, Natasha. Thank you, John. I must start uh, by reiterating that we love you too. Uh, it's uh, fantastic to have had your company throughout the journey of the Karwani Mahabharat. It's uh, been a great learning experience and 
you're the reason that we managed to get two meals a day when we were out on the roads uh, because you would look out for everyone uh, and uh, we would look out for you uh, as we traveled on those highways. So, uh, and thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, my, the last three years of my life have been uh, flashing by as I try to recall uh, point by point um, the, the story I want to piece together today, uh, the story of our country, our society, uh, what is happening in our families and in our own psyche as we watch uh, what is no longer a gradual uh, decline, but a very accelerated disintegration of our democracy, of our collective morality, of what we understand as good and bad and true and false. And uh, the, the fog thickens every day uh, as the newspaper hits our uh, door every morning or we check our phones to see what's new. Um, the confusion gets worse and worse and, and therefore it becomes even more important for us to meet in the way that we are meeting today uh, and, and to find every which way in, uh, in which we can actually express to each other, express to ourselves, try to separate uh, fact from fiction. And, 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 and find a path that will beat through uh, this fog and uh, take us to, towards the light again, in a sense. So I'm, I'm going to uh, tell this from the perspective of a campaign, uh, a campaign called uh, Karwani Mohabbat, uh, which is in itself a journey. The Karwani Mohabbat would translate as the caravan of love. It was announced in August 2017 uh, by Harsh Mandar uh, in the form of a fundraising campaign online. And um, while many uh, people had heard of Harsh Mandar, uh, many of us had read him, uh, and many of us were in our homes and in our uh, professional spaces uh, beginning to feel this very restless helplessness as we watched the spate of lynchings take off uh, ever since uh, uh, 2014. 2015 was uh, the first uh, hugely reported lynching, which was that of Mohammed Aklaq in Dadri, uh, which was followed very quickly by the lynching of Pehlu Khan in Mewat, of Junaid in a train uh, as he was going back from, 16-year-old uh, Junaid, as he was going back from Delhi uh, to his home in uh, UP and uh, and the news began to uh, you know what seemed like isolated incidents what seemed like uh, murders that were taking place in that, that did not seem to have any connection with each other soon began to uh, you know we began to suspect that there was uh, that there was something that there were some dots that needed to be co uh, connected and yet uh, the media wasn't doing it for us, the judiciary, the state, the police wasn't doing it for us. And it fell back to civil society to find a way to organize ourselves. Um, in 2017, mid 2017, um, there was a campaign that started in Delhi uh, called Not In My Name. And uh, very soon after that was another campaign uh, that was announced called the Karwani Mohabbat. And uh, John Dayal and I, uh, we, uh, we we got in touch uh, with the people who had announced it, and uh, while John John joined uh, the it from the uh, from the first day as it traveled, uh, the a group of people traveled to Assam, then Jharkhand, and then Mangalore. I joined uh, this journey in Delhi, and then uh, in a bus. Uh, full of people, which included artists, journalists, students, lawyers, um, uh, retired uh, scientists, people from all walks of life uh, who had taken out the time to come together collectively and, and see what it is that we could do as a collective uh, when, we, when we were feeling so isolated uh, on our own. We began to travel through East UP, 
then Mewat, Rajasthan, uh, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh. And in the beginning, uh, it was the, the stated objective of the Karwani Mahabat was to reach out to every victim's family who had been abandoned, not only by the state, uh, not only by society uh, from where the lynch mob had come, but also by their own community and their own neighbors. Because what we were beginning to see, uh, the pattern that was beginning to be very clear was that as soon as a heinous crime like this took place, very quickly the narrative would be built that the victim himself uh, had some kind of a criminal um, background, that the victim himself was um, was the person who, who was responsible for the crime that was committed on himself. So Muhammad Akhlaq in Dadri was accused of having beef in his house, Pehlu Khan, who had just bought a milch cow and he was a dairy farmer for 55,000 rupees and he actually had the uh, the government certificate to say uh, to show that he had bought that cow uh, uh, as a dairy farmer was accused of buying a cow for the purpose of sacrificing it for of killing it. Uh, Junaid uh, was killed because he was a Muslim, and and similarly uh, all, all the other stories. So we we could see that each of these victims was not only not getting any support from the state. They were finding themselves completely isolated in their homes. Nobody uh, had it in them uh, to, anybody who came up in support of them were then um, pushed back by the local police and, and by, uh, by the local media, which was also participating in the um, stigmatization of the victim himself. Um, and when we, when we began, so, so, so we wanted to reach out to people to whom nobody had reached out to. We wanted to be able to tell their story on various platforms and to continue to tell their story till everybody uh, would agree that this uh, was something that needed to be paid attention to. Uh, we wanted to find a way to identify what the needs of the family were. Uh, usually we would meet a widow, we would meet elderly, aged parents uh, who were completely bereft, and we would meet young children, none of whom uh, were empowered enough uh, to be able to support the family anymore in terms of a livelihood, leave alone deal with the grief that they had to uh, cope with and, and the legal processes that they were uh, inept at being able to navigate. Um, so we, we thought this would be a six month journey. We thought it would be work that would be done in a year's time and there would only be follow ups after that. But what we discovered was that the further we went, the more the number of uh, lynchings uh, uh, you know, began to increase and they they continued in newer areas. Uh, we ended up, John, uh, Harshmandar, uh, Priya Ramani, uh, myself, once in a while, my teenage daughter traveled with us. We were joined by many volunteers, by retired civil servants, uh, by journalists, artists, um, IT professionals. Pe people would hear of the journey and when it came close to them, they would join, they would fund it. Uh, what we uh, what we began to see was this this was becoming an endless quest and that there was no going back that this was something that where we needed to fortify ourselves more and more and we eventually um, began we, we created a legal team to be able to support those victims we created a media team to tell their stories on various platforms in different formats. So we were writing, we were making films, we were uh, sharing them on social media, we, we continue to do that. And we created a psychosocial support team uh, who uh, you know, reached out to the family continuously to make sure that their healthcare needs, their education needs, their livelihood needs, to some extent were taken care of, that they were not alone on the days that they had to go to court because many of them uh, continued to face uh, the threat of violence when they pursued the cases uh, in their fight for justice. 
these journeys took us uh, to Tripura, to Tamil Nadu, to uh, Karnataka, and there is no uh, state. I mean, the you know we we kind of mapped India. Um, it, it, these um, cases of lynch crimes, uh, we began to pay special attention to Assam because of the announcement of the uh, the first draft uh, list of the NRC uh, again in 2018. And very quickly it became apparent that um, there was no transparency, transparency in the processes uh, by which the NRC list was being drawn that very systematically the poor Bengali Muslim community of Assam was being targeted uh, and that there were the, the people who were being left out of the NRC were usually people who did not even know uh, what the right, what their own rights were, who did not have with themselves any of the resources to be able to navigate the systems that they were required to when they had to present their identity cards or get, uh, you know, their own identity cards made. Uh, so this mad scramble for papers, this arbitrary declaration of people as de-voters, uh, the setting up of detention camps in Assam, and all of this was happening so far from Delhi that there was a growing sense within the human rights community, uh, not only the Karwani Mahabad, but many other groups uh, that were paying attention to Assam, that if we did not escalate if we did not raise our voices if we did not knock on the courts or, uh, on the doors of the supreme court if we did not make the films uh, right to people uh, you know in a sense scream from the rooftops the injustices that were taking place in assam would go unseen unheard unnoticed what many people began to predict and warn us about, warn each other about, was that what was happening in NR, uh, in Assam needed to be, uh, we needed to intervene uh, at a human rights level and at a legal level because uh, what was happening in Assam, if, if the state got away with it, uh, it you know, they, they would have a roadmap for uh, this kind of othering of the minorities in the rest of the country as well. And uh, 2019 uh, brought many surprises for us. Um, uh, Rebecca has already mentioned the abrogation, the sudden abrogation of Article 370. And, and more than that, the, the, the taking away of all the fundamental democratic rights of an entire state uh, you know, the, the arbitrariness, the, the way in which people were jailed, the way their internet was cut, uh, the incarceration of the leaders, the, the, the cutting off of the tongue of an entire uh, state, and, and the collusion of the media, uh, of the mainstream media in, in all of these. So that was, that was the first shock in a sense. Uh, after that, the uh, Assam NRC list was announced and there was mass confusion. Then we had the Ayodhya judgment, uh, which, uh, which, we, which we began to feel was the biggest shock of it all uh, in um, December last year, you know, when there, there were many parts of the country were put under curfew, schools were shut uh, in anticipation of riots when the judgment was going to come out. Uh, but actually what we, what the judgment actually brought down stunned silence for a very long time. Uh, you know, was this the kind of justice that the Supreme Court was going to meet out now? And then came uh, what was the CAB and uh, later became the CAA, the Citizenship Amendment Act. Um, uh, it's, it's very fresh in our memory. Um, uh, you know, we, we, as a group, all the learnings that we had got of working in Assam uh, had created in us a sense of how terrible this was going to be if it was actually implemented throughout the country. And luckily, it was 
you know, the students uh, of various universities reacted immediately. It did not, it, the reactions were, no, were not um, isolated. They were not only the human rights community or only the, uh, you know, the legal community. The, somehow we discovered that in every part of the country, in urban uh, areas, in rural areas, in small towns, people suddenly, and not only of the minority community, but also of the majority community, um, and also many people who had actually voted for this government to come back into power, suddenly standing up and saying, what is this about? Uh, why are we beginning to question the citizenship of people who we know are Indians? And, and so what began as shock also created a kind of a mass movement and uh, as soon as the students of Jamia, Delhi University, JNU, and Alikar, a Muslim university, began to protest, and these were peaceful protests, there was police action on campuses, which completely accelerated um, uh, the anti-CAA movement that led to the women sitting down uh, in Shaheen Bagh, which, as we all know, led to 22 protest sites in Delhi itself, protest sites, hundreds of protest sites all over India. And for some time, a, almost a festive sense, uh, you know, the constitution came back into everyday conversation. People were distributing the preamble to each other. My children were reading the preamble. Suddenly everything they had studied in school began to make sense. They began to get a sense of what it means to belong to a country uh, my relatives in my own family who had voted for this government calling me up to say, this is a bit too much. They shouldn't have gone this far. And so what it did actually was for some time, it, it, it created a sense of unity. Uh, it created, it, it brought back a sense of what it meant to be, a, what it means to be a peaceful democratic society, because suddenly everybody had a sense of threat, uh, you know, the, the announcement of the NPR. And what we were also witnessing was the spilling over of uh, unprovoked police action, what started on the campuses of Delhi, of, of universities, then happened on, in Mandi House in Delhi, on Jantar Mantar, uh, and uh, spilled into the small towns of Uttar Pradesh. Uh, December 2019 saw a level of violence uh, of the police targeted towards peaceful protesters, poor protesters, Muslim neighborhoods throughout the small towns of Uttar Pradesh at a scale that brought back memories of Gujarat 2002 to many of the people who had seen both. And because this was so close to Delhi, because we were already all on high alert, many, many organizations came together and many of those are now have somebody or the other incarcerated as a political prisoner. And Rebecca mentioned many of those names. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, organizations like the uh, like Pinjaratur, uh, Karwani Mohabbat, um, Action uh, um, Against Hate. Um, sorry, I'm forgetting the United Against Hate. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we 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 all came together. We all began to have urgent conversations with each other. We all began to collaborate on the ground to reach out to victims who were not only being, uh, who were not only facing police violence, the scale of the violence spilled into hospitals. Uh, when they were, when wounded people were being taken into hospitals in Agra, in Bareilly, in, 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 in the entire uh, West UP belt, uh, Kanpur, Lucknow, uh, they, depending on the religion of the victim, they were getting or not getting medical attention. So we, we actually became witnesses to a kind of genocidal violence 
uh, that was very, very shocking, very, very difficult to believe, to process as we were witnessing it. And yet we had no choice except to keep responding in, in, in whatever way. And uh, which is also why the, the peaceful protests at the various protest sites began to grow and began to become much more determined. Because if this act really was as benign as the government wanted us to believe, then why was the state being so violent against the protesters why why was there no dialogue why were the messages that we were getting from the home minister and the prime minister contradicting each other uh, none of these things were making sense uh, we know what happened next um, uh, there was violence in delhi in the last week of february again uh, it unfolded before our very eyes not only did you have to you know was it very not only were we on the ground, many, many of us on the ground witnessing the violence, but the violence was being played out live on our social media streams. So perpetrators were doing, were actually doing Facebook lives, they were doing Twitter lives, they were broadcasting on WhatsApp as they were collecting mobs and inciting them to be violent against the Muslim community of Northeast Delhi. These videos are in the public domain. These videos have been downloaded. Um, there, you know, there is there is so much evidence. Not only is it uh, fresh in our memories, there is so much evidence of what happened and what didn't happen. And yet, we stand today at a time when those people who tried to control the violence are incarcerated. They are in jail. They are being accused of having incited the riots. And those people who are visible on video actually perpetrating the violence are not being questioned. There is a hate speech case against Harsh Mandar that has hauled him into Supreme Court. But um, the hate speech that we are constantly trying to call out of Kapil Mishra, of Arat Thakur, uh, is, is, is not being paid attention to by, by the same judiciary. So, um, uh, you know, like I said in the beginning, it's not any longer a slow chipping away. It's a very, very accelerated assault that we are witnessing every day. It's not easy um, to be able to, you know, constantly make the connections. The the, uh, the Delhi violence quickly led into the pandemic, which which went into the lockdown. Uh, we all know about the mass migrations um, th that migrant labor had to make, the way people were walking, the way that the civil society again stepped in, you know, while people were losing their own livelihoods, their own incomes were being slashed. They were coming together to feed those who did not have, uh, you know, even two meals a day. They were donating, they were standing on the streets and distributing water and biscuits to migrants labor across the country, across the country. We, we witness these scenes. Um, so what we are seeing is, is, you know, what is hopeful in this entire scene is the consistent reaction of civil society, how one group is able to inspire another group. One of the places we went to in February this year was Malir Kotla. Malir Kotla in Punjab is a, is a very small town. It is the only district in Punjab that has a Muslim majority. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the royal family of Malir Kotla, uh, you know, which was a Muslim uh, royal family, declared in 1947 that they, um, you know, there was a pact between the Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs of Malir Kotla that there would be no violence in. In, in that district when partition was going on. And the Muslims of Malir Kotla did not migrate. Similarly to the stories that we hear in Mewat, where the Muslims of Mewat did not migrate because Gandhi himself went to Mewat and said, we will protect you. You do not have to leave your lands. Uh, you do not have to leave your motherland uh, and go anywhere. And these, and what we, what we witnessed in Malir Kotla were anti-CA protests being led by Sikh and Muslim communities. 
they were organizing the the speeches the protests the the feeding you know the uh, the same people came to delhi to shaheen bagh to support protest sites they went to northeast delhi after the violence took place to uh, the gurdwaras were opened to be able to take in people who had suddenly been rendered homeless so what while on the one hand we are seeing a very tyrannical state we are uh, you know we are we are seeing what uh, is 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 very clearly um, disintegrating uh, into fascism uh, we are also seeing that civil society is is struggling to and managing to create connections with each other and in a sense the fact that i'm sitting here talking to all of you uh, you know is also an example of the same we have managed to make these connections not because uh, you know we, we we met somewhere and became friends but because the struggle uh, to restore our sense of okayness as a society or our sense of wellness as a society has brought us together and um, that is what uh, gives me a lot of hope that is what uh, i'm sure um gives every uh, everyone else who gets involved in this uh, a sense not only of hope but of energy of determination uh, of knowing that uh, you know why we may uh, you know that that why we are uh, also experiencing the grief of of losing something that we had taken for granted of watching in 2020 what seems like Uh, the dark age is descending on our country but also we are finding um, within ourselves yeah, and within uh, within our own memories a sense of what it means to belong to this country to be an indian to be part of a society that is syncretic that takes pride in its secret in its syncreticity syncreticity and uh, that will not allow it to be uh, demolished in the way that um, you know the, uh, that that many many other groups plan to uh, to do um and um, uh, th that's uh, that's what brings us to this uh, point many many of our uh, many of the people we admire are in prison we have to remember every day that our solidarities must remain strong that um, uh, lawyers um, writers academics i mean many of us have sacrificed different parts of uh, you know our comfortable lives to be able to do uh, the work that we are doing but but there's also the realization that there were there is no way in which we can salvage uh, what we know as normal see unless we are willing to rise above ourselves and um, and and hold each other's hands and and create collaborations um so with that i hand over back to john dayal if if there's uh, any part of the story that i missed john please add it thank you very much there are something you did miss and i would do not want to speak out then but uh, natasha herself and our family are a growing example of what it means to share love with so many different groups of people in those muslims sikhs and so on and so forth and i hope sometime in the future christians too catholics in particular <laughs> but thank you natasha thank you very much because you have taken what rebecca began on this document also as a document of hope for the future but i would like to add that it is not a straw at which we clutch it's it is a living document and it has been buffeted many times before as christians as christian activists as catholics the catholic union was the first to protest and back in 1950 the basic empowering clause in the constitution article 341 which said that because dalits have suffered for 3000 years inhuman absolutely an inhuman existence they need support there was no question of religion at that but there were muslim sikhs buddhists or hindus all of them had been suffering the same thing because caste was in the soil 
of this country and the Constituent Assembly had discussed it. The first, among the first few erosions of the Constitution was the Presidential Order of 1950, which said, which took away, in fact, the right of freedom of choosing a religion from the Dalits. Brahmins had it, Kshatriyas had it, everybody else had it. But the Dalits had to remain Hindus if they wanted to take this gift from the state. If they became Sikhs or they became Buddhists or they became Muslims or they became Christians, they would be deprived of their jobs, their seats in parliament, their scholarships, their seats in engineering colleges. They would be reduced and sent back to the gutters which they were cleaning for 3,000 years. This was removing and confining the freedom of faith on the most classic articles in the constitution only to an elite and not to everybody else. The Sikhs fought the good fought and they got it back. The Muslims and the Christians are fighting now and the Catholic Union led the fight for the last 70 years. We are yet to get it because the courts also have been insidious in the treatment of it, despite expert committees, judicial commissions finding in favor. But this is just one of the many things. The anti-conversion laws now in eight states, quashed by many high courts, upheld unfortunately by the Supreme Court. These are issues that disturb minorities much and feed our fears. Our next speaker is Theodore Maskaranas, Bishop, a member of the Pillar Fathers, a scholar, an activist, a fearless man, outspoken man, maybe sometimes speaks a bit too much according to some others, but he is known for speaking the bitter truth. He is today the Auxiliary Bishop of Rachi, and he and his bishop led the longest <laughs> protest chain in favor of Stan and his co, what should I call them, co jailees co-prisoners, asking for the release. The fight in Jharkhand is consistent. They persuaded the government to come and support the cause. And we look, by the way, Bishop, you know that two of the lynching cases that Natasha spoke of and I mentioned were of Catholics in Jharkhand lynched on the suspicion of carrying beef. That is how the antisocials don't discriminate. The socials, unfortunately, seem to. Bishop, your floor. Uh, thank you, John. It's a little difficult to speak after two brilliant women speaking before you. Uh, Rebecca and Natasha, they have laid out quite a bit of material before us. And uh, I live among very poor people here. Do I stay in Ranchi? I visit the villages, live among the Adivasis. And my journey consists a little bit in experiencing their poverty, their hopes, and their dreams. And this Constitution Day, I think I'll just share a few of my experiences um, with uh, a little bit of constitutional knowledge. Uh, a few things. First, the nature of our Constitution is equally proportionate to the nature of our country. I think this has to be kept in mind if we want to understand our constitution. Our founding fathers were facing poverty, extreme poverty, had a country that was facing extreme poverty, was facing caste discrimination, was just recovering from riotous bloodshed, as we have already spoken. And they thought they would live, they would leave a vision of a country that hopefully would be different in the future. Has it become different? Has, have things changed? I would say to a great extent, this country has made many, many leaps forward. But there are many, many things that have not been done 
and there are many many things that we are falling back upon and i think uh, this is very important because what actually is happening to this country today this this is the question that we have to ask see i i said i have an experience of going down into the into the villages and down in the villages you see a health system that does not exist an educational system that either discriminates education to such a great extent or an education system where sometimes schools are held under trees and uh, speak of online education today thousands millions of children have no chance of educating themselves a whole year lost in this so called online education we have a social system fortunately the adivasi community does not have a caste system within itself but the whole adivasi group is become sort of excluded people marginalized people deprived people it is in that type of a country that we were living till new problems have started coming up and john said that i speak i speak what i feel and i think unless we speak what about we feel we will not be the real persons that we are demonetization was a terrible blow to so many people the lockdown that came whether intentionally or unintentionally it has brought many more people into poverty and while all this is happening we have a media that knows best what it does i don't know even whether god knows what the media is up to we have institutions that at least to be appear to be heavily compromised judiciary we had the case of mother teresa sisters which we are still fighting we have the case of uh, father alphonse who is in jail without even knowing the who those people were who wanted to organize a program in his in his school compound we come to what the preamble tells us speaks of justice liberty equality and fraternity and on all four counts i would not like to mark the country i would not like to mark the progress but a lot of introspection has to be done when we speak of justice Uh, natasha and rebecca i have spoken much in depth about real life issues i am i would like to speak on a much deeper level that we are facing here what chance has a poor adivasi of getting justice in any of our courts how many lawyers would be able to help them if at every sitting you have to pay a minimum of 10000 rupees where can a poor man go to get this justice and when you appear in court adjournment after adjournment adjournment after adjournment and at the end you do not get what you want in a lower court you move to a higher court and if the other one wins he goes into a higher court where can the poor go to fight for this justice this is a question i am asking a question as a pastor that i see people when we speak about justice in the health system where is the justice i have had cases here where people had to be just pushed into government hospitals where there was not even a bed because they have no money to pay and those who had to pay money the minimum they had to pay and that was in very subsidized hospitals like our mandar hospital they had to pay 7 8000 a day 7 8000 a day is huge money but medicines are not subsidized 
and therefore those costly medicines to be given for covid they have to be they have to be given a family of five that fell sick and got themselves admitted in, in a hospital because there was no place either in manda or another hospital five people paid 6 lakhs in 18 days where can a family get that money these things sometimes i feel on my conscience what can we do to help these people this this is a constitutional day the constitution guarantees justice where is the justice for the poor when we when we talk about education when children have to commit suicide because their parents can't find buy them a mobile and these are the middle class children you think of the poor children who can't even think of a phone forget a mobile android mobile one mother was telling me uh, swami ji i have three children where can i get three mobiles for them can we provide mobile so all this million so this online education is a big sham where is the justice there when we talk about a justice where is the justice when the lands of the tribals are being taken for big industries people simply displaced where is the justice when activists who fight for them have to suffer in prison and they don't get bail under uapa or under whatever laws that are put placed so where what justice are we talking of in our constitution are there those conditions which make justice possible that is the first question that i raise on the question of justice when there is no justice how can we think about the second founding principle equality equality does not mean all have to have the same wealth but all must at least have the same opportunities what opportunity does my rural child in a remote corner of jharkhand or even in a remote corner of the ranchi aaj dais is what opportunities does he have that he can compete with the children of the rich who generation and generation have been empowered and these children have no absolutely no place to go how much can they live on our charity and how much charity can we do can how can they be empowered that is the second constitutional question that i am raising because the constitution promises them equality equality before everything before law equality in opportunity equality in a right to their to their living and the type of living we talk about fraternity fraternity is something they keep on uh, quoting lot of sanskrit and i'll say and say uh, that this country has a long tradition long tradition of communal harmony it's true but this country also has a long tradition of communal disharmony and those wedges those divisions are being made sharper and sharper hatred uh, john uh, rightly said uh, there were lynching here in jharkhand that was before i came back here uh, i was in delhi at that time it was in the transition period there were lynching of catholics here but those are not the only lynching that are taking place the physical there are different other lynchings taking place continuously in the in the communal disharmony that is being created the whole propaganda that is being created about conversions it it is not simply uh, a debate as many people think Con- anti conversion and conversion is not conversion laws are not simply a debate behind that whole platform of conversion and anti conversion there is a hatred being created against the christian community this there is there is a a hatred that is going deep into the blood of the youngsters and that is my worry for this country 
First it was with another community, now it is with our community, tomorrow it will be within the community. Uh, and, and this whole question of secularism is, is not only about the church fighting for it or the Muslims fighting for it. I think the majority community should be equally worried because when there is no harmony in this country, there will be no progress. When there is no progress, again there will be more disharmony. And the lack of development cannot be covered by speeches inciting communal violence. The lack of not doing anything for the people, for not fulfilling promises, whatever government it may be, whichever, whether state, central, whichever, nobody should use religion to put one against the other. That was not what religion was meant for. The fraternity in this country has to be restored and we uh, together have to think out with all like-minded and as, as the Bible says, men and women of goodwill, how that goodwill can be brought back to society. Yeah, I'm very happy that uh, All India Catholic Union is organizing a number of discussions, debates, and uh, I sometimes I feel very happy because I was somehow um, involved with Lancy, with John and the others, Chinnappan and others in in getting back the the All India Catholic Union to a good relationship with with the bishops, except with ex, uh, at least with me. I don't know about the other bishop, but uh, uh, building a good relationship. And uh, I'm, I'm so happy that these things are happening. And uh, I, I don't want to be long because I am also um, going to leave shortly because of certain issues, but uh, not with you uh, that I have to, I have to just, uh, I'm just come back from Jamshedpur. And, uh, uh, I'd like to end with three warnings that Ambedkar gave in his speech in June, uh, November 25th, 1959, November 26, 1959, one year before the constitution was actually signed. And he said the three warnings he gave. The first thing in my judgment we must do is to hold fast to constitutional methods. These are words of Ambedkar of achieving a source of public objectives. Nothing unconstitutional should be done to uphold the constitution itself. And therefore, when you get angry, don't get into violence, don't get into anarchy, that is what he tells. The second, the second we must do, and this is, a, this is a very important one, which I think is affecting today, and I'll quote it, and not make any comments on it. You can draw your own conclusions on it. The second warning that Ambedkar gives is, the second thing we must do is to observe the caution which John Stuart Mill has given us. John Stuart Mill has given us to all who are interested in the maintenance of democracy, namely, and listen attentively, not to lay their liberties at the feet of even a great man or to trust him with power which enables him to subvert their institutions. There is nothing wrong in being grateful to great men who have rendered lifelong services to the country. These are words of Ambedkar that I'm reading. But there are limits to gratefulness. As has been well said by the Irish patriot Daniel O'Connor, no man can be grateful at the cost of his honor. No woman can be grateful at the cost of her chastity. And no nation can be grateful at the cost of its liberty. This caution is far more necessary in the case of India than in the case of any other country. And Ambedkar reminds us this, for in India, bhakti, or what may be called the path of devotion or hero worship, plays a part in its politics, unequaled in magnitude by the part it plays in the politics of any other country in the world. Bhakti in religion may be a road to salvation of the soul. But in politics, bhakti or hero worship is a sure road to degradation and to eventual dictator. These are words of Ambedkar. I do not comment on them. It is left for you to 
to think, introspect, and reflect what they mean to us in today's world. And the third, he wonders, the third thing we must do is not to be content with mere political democracy. We must make a political democracy a social democracy as well. Political democracy cannot last unless there lies at the base of it social democracy. And social democracy means giving the rights to the Dalits, to the Adivasis, to the poor, the trout trodden, the rights that are theirs. See, we as a minority, and I repeat this, I have repeatedly said this, we are not begging and pleading for favors. We are asking for our rights. And that the Dalits are excluded the Dalit Christians, the Dalit Muslims, or I like to call them, call them uh, Christians of Dalit origin, because once you come into Christianity, there's no casteism, should not be at least, but the Christians of Dalit origin, there's no justice done to them until they get the same rights as Dalits elsewhere get. This I have held while I was CBCI Secretary General, I have fought for this. We try to reopen those cases. Things have been moving also because of the strong support of the All India Catholic Union. And I think this country cannot rest until it gets its justice, its liberty, its equality, its fraternity in full. There are dangers, but there is hope. There is hope because this country has passed an emergency at one time, has won over that emergency. This country has people who think not everybody does bhakti. There might be a time when bhakti is higher than, than reasoning, but there are also times when reasoning is higher than bhakti. And it is my hope that that time will come when the media will not only attack the opposition, but will also take on the government. That is my hope that the media that is covering up many things will come out in the open about number of things. As I said, I, I, I like to go, I, I've already explained to Lancy why I'd like to go. Uh, I just, I had promised that I would be here and uh, therefore in spite of everything, I am here because I wanted to keep my promise. I did not want to be one of those promise breakers on Constitutional Day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bishop. For a moment, I was locked out for reasons I do not know, but I came back just in time. I requested Elias to take over if I couldn't make it in time. Yeah, good, to have you back. good to have you back, John. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Bishop. I think uh, yours was, as usual, a very frank uh, look and a very critical look at the Constitution, the book that we like, apart from the other book which we worship, the Bible, and which also, by the way, links us, this book links us to Muslims, to Jews, and to many others, Ahle Kitab, all of them. Uh, thank you very much. We hope uh, that your wise counsel will continue to be with us. Thank you for reminding us that you reconciled us with the bishops. We always want to be reconciled with the bishops. I hope they want to be reconciled with us, not only in John. the CBCI, but, but in the dioceses and the representatives in the parishes. We are at the grassroots, and that is where the Constitution is observed, defined, and also protected. Thank you very much, Bishop, for your presence. John, to be reconciled, you must first fight. Thank you very much. And that have that a nice we do. Evening. That we do indeed. Uh, have a nice. Next, thank you, Bishop. Uh, have our a next nice. Speaker, yes. right. our thank next you. Speaker, yeah. Our next speaker is one of our own. Rafael de Souza is president of the Bamba Catholic Sabha, which is the biggest diocese and therefore the biggest Catholic Sabha in the country. It is bigger than the Catholic associations of many countries in Europe, if I may say so. He is also a prominent. Uh, member of the leadership of the Olympic Catholic Union and the host who has opened up his doors and uh, his associations, his sabhas, Tilbox, if I may say so, to give us this, this forum free of charge every time we use 
of the Webex system. So in this, with these words of gratitude, Rafael is a lawyer practicing in the Bombay High Court and uh, is one of our legal counsels, gives us a sound advice privately and publicly, uh, sometimes differs, mostly agrees. And uh, we are looking forward to his participation, not as an office bearer of the Catholic Union, which he continues to be, but as a senior lawyer himself. Uh, thank you, Dr. John Dayal, uh, the president of All India Catholic Union, uh, Land City Kuna, his lordship, Bishop Theodore, the previous speakers, uh, Natasha Badwar and uh, senior advocate Rebecca Jo, and my dear friends, I'm not too sure whether I deserve to be in the company of this August panel to speak to you. But what am I uh, to decide when the national president of All India Catholic Union and the spokesperson veto and say the access fallen on you? Well, my dear friends, uh, today is a constitutional day and we are talking about defending the constitutional rights. From August 29th, 1947 till 26th of November, 1949, a period of 12 years, two months and 28 days. That is the time taken by the constitution committee of our country to draft the constitution and lay the final draft of the constitution before the constituent assembly. While some say Mr. B. N. Rao, the constitutional advisor, prepared the initial draft based on his research into constitutions of other nations, it is also recorded that Baba Sahib Ambedkar who is called the father of the constitution, studied constitutions of over 60 countries before drafting our constitution. So we can imagine the research and hard work that has gone into in framing of our constitution. Indian constitution is not only the most exhaustive written constitution in the world, it had originally 395 articles divided into 22 parts, which has now crossed over 448 articles divided into 27 parts. Indian constitution is also, although is young at 70s, is the most amended constitution in the world. Whereas the Constitution of USA, which is about 200 years old, had 27 amendments. As of 25th of January 2020, we saw our Constitution being amended about 104 times. Sovereignty, socialism, secularism, democracy, republican character of Indian state, Justice, liberty, equality, fraternity, human dignity, and the unity and integrity of the nation are the valuable insights that are enshrined in our constitution. Today, as we are talking about defending the constitutional rights, we have to ask ourselves, who is the defender of the Constitution? Today, Indian Constitution functions or the framers of the Constitution divided the Constitution, giving separate rights to the legislature, to the executive and to the judiciary. While legislature was enshrined with the responsibility of making laws, the executive implemented the laws and the judiciary, especially the higher judiciary, interpreted them. 
Part three of the Constitution lays down the fundamental rights, and in the same part, Article thirty-two of the Constitution, it is the Supreme Court of India, which is the ultimate defender of the fundamental rights of the citizen, and thus arguably. the most responsible organ under the constitution to defend the constitution just for your knowledge i would like to read what article 32 1 and 2 says the right to move the supreme court by appropriate proceedings for en enforcement of the rights conferred under this is guaranteed to go into the supreme court is a constitutional right guaranteed to protect the fundamental rights my previous speakers especially senior advocate rebecca john has already pointed out the statements made by the chief justice of india in a recent case and i do not know whether he was right making those statements vis a vis what is there on article 32 in bracket 1 article 32 in bracket 2 says the supreme court shall have power to issue directions or orders and writs whichever may be appropriate for the enforcement of any rights conferred by this part and the sub clause forces the rights guaranteed to the supreme court by this article shall not be suspended except as otherwise provided in the constitution so my dear friends the supreme court of india has the tallest responsibility in defending the constitution Baba Saheb Ambedkar has been already referred to and quoted in several instances by our previous speakers. He said, "I would like so like to quote one." He says, "However good a constitution it may be, it depends on those who implement it. The constitution is as good." or as bad as the people who implement the constitutional rights as the courts always been defending the constitutional rights of uh, the citizens i would like to say partially yes and partially no as far as the landmark judgments some of the landmark judgments the supreme court where upheld the fundamental rights is one of the landmark cases the kesan and the bharti case where the 13 judges bench of the supreme court held that the basic structure of the constitution could not be abrogated even by a constitution amendment today in the history of indian judiciary this is the largest bench which has ruled that the constitutional basic structure that the fundamental rights part 3 could not be amended even by a, an amendment the second i'm sorry the second case where the supreme court according to me upheld the fundamental rights is that of romesh thapar versus state of madras wherein the constitution bench of the apex court held that in a democracy people have a right to criticize the government the court said and i quote criticism of the government exciting disaffection 
or bad feelings towards it is not to be regarded as justifying ground for restricting freedom of expression and the third just judgment that i can quote is the two bench two judge bench judgment of the supreme court recently in arnab's case while it is questionable that the electricity by which arnab's case landed up in supreme court and he got relief what statements the judge made is very relevant justice chandrasud while hearing the arguments and countering it has said if we that is the Cons supreme court as a constitutional court do not lay down law and protect the personal liberty then who will and then he says if we do not interfere in this case today we will be traveling down a path of destruction so these are some of the instances where the supreme court of india has really upheld the fundamental rights of the citizen there are judgments of the supreme court which have led to the constitutional amendment and here i would like to quote the first of the judgments that influence the uh, in judgment of the supreme court that influence an amendment to the constitution it is the champakam doraya rajan case versus the state of madras in 1950 the year in which the constitution came into existence this champakan doraya rajan a brahmin filed a petition for issuance of a writ of mandamus restraining the then state of madras from enforcing communal government order that provided reservation in electoral constituencies constituencies a full bench of the madras high court upheld the petitioner's plea the appeal from state to the supreme court was dismissed by the supreme court this resulted in the first of the constitutional amendments on 10th of may 1951 wherein clause 4 was added to article 15 which allowed states to make any special provision for advancement of any specially educationally backward classes of citizens and for scheduled caste and scheduled tribes the second case that i can refer to is the golaknath versus the state of punjab case here the supreme court held that law made by the parliament should not infringe or take away the fundamental rights as provided under the constitution and this resulted in the 24th amendment to the constitution which gave powers to the parliament to amend any provisions of the constitution and the third case as i have already referred is the keshan on the bharti case where a 13 bench judge of the supreme court held that the basic structure of the constitution cannot be changed and now the fundamental rights have become the fundamental right doctrine the fourth case that can be referred is the indira gandhi versus the raj narayan case in 1975 after the allahabad high court judgment disqualifying indira gandhi the parliament brought in the constitutional amendment number 39 which said that no election 
to either house of the parliament of a person who holds the office of the prime minister at the time of such election or is appointed as prime minister after such election second to the house of the people of a person who holds the office of the speaker of that house at the time of such election or who is chosen as speaker for that house after the election shall be called in question before any court so this was to support the constitution and to keep away the office of the prime minister uh, the speaker and the other dignitaries away from the constitutional challenge the supreme court struck down the clause 4 of the 39th amendment and all of us are aware then when janata party came into power by the 44th amendment article 329 was which was brought in by 39 was repealed now the supreme court has also come into the scrutiny while on occasions as discussed earlier the supreme court has shown its supremeness it has also come up for scrutiny for inaction in or selective speed apart from the general public that is you and me or the civil society of which we are a part justice kadju the retired judge of the supreme court in his opinion on law published in the wire points out how supreme court failed to grant a researcher columnist abhijit ayer mitra in 2018 december from granting bail even after tendering an unconditional apology and his offense was what posting a satirical tweet on the konak temple further elaborating on people having been arrested for charges of sedition and which are illegal unwarranted and the detention detention of such people he has said the supreme court not taking so moto cognizance of the personal liberty is like bishma pitama turning a blind eye to the disrobing of the draupadi and supreme court becoming a spectator for blatant and glaring illegalities in his anguish he asks what then will remain of the numerous verdicts of the court itself stating that the supreme court is a guardian of people's right now we are also aware what happened in the case of mr prashant bhushan the speed by which his tweets came to be converted into a contempt of court petition through a motto and thereafter after spending valuable time and energy of the apex court punished with 1 rupee fine these are all instances where we ask whether the courts have been impartial in delivering justice system yet another case wherein the supreme court has come for supreme scrutiny is granting of bail on the guise of protecting the personal liberty the speed by which arnab's case traveled 
from the lowest court to the highest court a matter of seven days does it amount to equality of justice or discrimination of justice now when the defender of the constitution fails the civil society rises the civil society movements are required because it will fight and protect the basic human needs against the tyranny of the state the right of minority depressed class along with the individual rights of freedom liberty and fight for its protection further civil society has a great role in stopping the majoritarian tendencies as we are seeing now and protecting the spirit of diversity in india the civil society's involvement we are aware is the cause of several legislations to be brought in and one of them being the right to information act how has the civil society influenced the judgments of the courts when i analyze uh, the various judgments that have been delivered by the supreme court ever since the great justice krishna iyer sowed the seed of public interest litigation in 1976 in the case of mumbai kamgar sabha versus abdul bai in 1976 the civil society has played a very vital role out of several instances i would like to quote just a few judgments of the supreme court the first one that comes to mind is mc mehta versus union of india 1986 this public interest litigation was filed on the escape of poisonous gas from the carbide factory in bhopal invoking article 21 of the constitution article 21 of the constitution guarantees right to life the apex court in this upheld the right to life of people under the article 32 while deciding on this pil then we have the vishaka and others versus state of rajasthan in 1997 this again is on account of a pil filed in the supreme court by vishaka and other women's group demanding enforcement of fundamental rights for working women under article 14 19 21 of the constitution this resulted in the supreme court issuing guidelines for working women which are now famous by vishaka guidelines the next that comes to mind is dk basu versus the state of west bengal in this case the supreme court laid down the basic requirements to be followed in all cases of arrest or detention to prevent custodial violence this petition arose from a letter dated 26th august 1986 addressed by the executive chairman legal aid services west bengal ngo to the chief justice of india drawing his attention to reports of custodial deaths and had asked 
that the issue of custodial jurisprudence be examined in depth to prevent death in public lockups and custody. Today, as we labor on the constitutional rights and its defending, we we'll look around us how the constitution is being systematically throttled. While people who should have been behind bars are outside the prison, whereas civil rights activists, those who are fighting for the downtrodden and those who are fighting for the marginalized are being thrown into prison. The photograph that is there on the poster and the zeros that are there at the bottom of the poster is a reminder to the defender of the constitution that is the Supreme Court of India that not only the cases of people like Arnabs require their attention but those several thousands of people, those who are elderly and senior citizens who are languishing without a trial. I hope the Supreme Court and the judges like Justice Chandrasur take notice of these and ask themselves today, is it not a travesty of justice to deny them liberty, deny them bail while their trial is pending? With this, I would like to rest my presentation and hand back over to Dr. John Dyer. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Advocate. We reserve our judgment for next year. But meanwhile, to respond to the query you raised, Towards the end, people who ought to be in jail are roaming free and people who ought to be free are in jail. It's called the clean cheat syndrome. Thank you very much for that lucid, educated dissertation. We hope to have the written copy also so to be distributed to reporters after this. Uh, I wish we could have uh, many questions that arise to be answered, but at 8.36, we have far exceeded the scheduled time, and uh, the membership of the webinar is coming down at 78 from a very, very high high for a Catholic Union webinar. So I, in my capacity as moderator, must make a very drastic ruling there will be no more questions unless, because Natasha is still with us, unless there's a question to her, we will take three brief questions before I ask Elias Vaz to say thank you. Please uh, uh, raise your hand or whatever, unmute yourself, the first voice speak. Anybody who is here? Yeah, okay. Sir, uh, actually, my, my voice is a non-Catholic voice. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 who yeah. can be a Catholic okay, if okay. you're not universal? Yeah. 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 So what I uh, uh, all the all the speeches were brilliant speeches, and um, it, well, hello, it, my friend, my old friend Ipe. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Now I see you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, you're as Catholic as they come. <laughs> universal. Right. Yeah. So um, uh, the thing is, uh, the question I have is, you know, um, now we, we've uh, we, we've questioned about um, article, I mean, uh, ruling 30, uh, 32. Now, in all these cases, as as social uh, activist, OK, where does contempt of court come? Now, suppose we we uh, we, okay. we we fight well, through through. We got, the, we got the question. We got the question because this has been discussed. Natasha, it's for you. 
Only questions addressed to you are to be answered. Natasha, please unmute yourself. Natasha, for you. Okay, while she unmutes herself, second question we can take, she'll answer together. Yeah. Please, any, anybody else? My own phone is creating problems. Natasha, can you hear us? Natasha, that question was to you. Hello. Yes. Yeah, um, just, just give me the question again. No, the question was, should we really be afraid of contempt of court as civil society? Or should we chicken out and go into hiding? <clears throat> so uh, that's always the choice, right? Uh, if we feel isolated as individuals, we will be forced to chicken out. We will be for we, you know we will be forced to think about our personal safety. But when, for example, uh, when Prashant Bhushan stood his ground, and of course he had the privilege of being Prashant Bhushan when he did that. But what we saw was an example of what happens when the collective comes together and one man shows the courage. The kind of uh, solidarity and support that was expressed for him by people who had live webinars going on every time there was a court hearing, as well as the people who were sending messages at that time, and, and you know, not to mention the media and uh, people who uh, braved the lockdown and the pandemic to come to the Supreme Court and actually stand there with their masks on, knowing that the police could lati charge them. So one man's courage led to the um, you know the courage of everybody else yeah, kind of change a little. Uh, uh, coming um, uh, you know, <clears throat> um, kind of awakening. So what we have to do is make sure that none of us feels isolated. What we have to do is make sure that we are networked, that we are connected, that we know when to ask for help, and we know who to ask for help, and be there when, uh, when, when we are in a position to be able to give solidarity to the other. So Kunal Kamra, in a sense, is doing the, uh, the same thing. He's, uh, he's tempting the court. He's, uh, he's standing up and saying, come and get me. And, uh, and the court is um, uh, reluctant because they don't want to uh, you know, um, make the same mistake again and have uh, muddled their own face. Yeah, thank you very much because the question is very really relevant to us in the Catholic Union. How far can we go? Can we risk our necks? Can we stretch our necks out? So we are contemplating several approaches, including filing writs in the Supreme Court to see that, for instance, people over 70 or 75 are not kept in lockups if they, if they are not convicts, if they're just under trials, or it's, if they're not even under trials, they're just suspects, and they're kept for such a long period under these terrible laws like UAPA, etc. And uh, there are always two schools of thought. One says, bide your time, and things are better, and there's a better bench. The other says, dare. So somebody who doesn't dare, he won't win. So that is a, quite a trauma for most people in civil society. Anybody else wants to question Natasha on a civil society approach? She's not a lawyer, but she knows many lawyers, I can tell you that. So after that pregnant pause, may I thank Natasha once again for speaking out for civil society and for that note of courage, because hope without courage is asking for the moon. Hope with courage 
It's bringing the moon under your grasp. Thank you very much, Natasha. Thank, Thank you, you, Rebecca, Mam and John. Thank you, dear Bishop, the two in absentia. Thank you, Rafael, for again that very professional, almost academic discourse. And to find good speakers among ourselves is such a such a joy always. May I call upon the Catholic Union Vice President, Elias Vaz, engineer in Goa, a man who will go far to give us the formal word of thanks. Elias. Unmute yourself, Elias. We have got so used to being muted by the government and the police and the chief minister and the bishop and other wives or husbands, as the case may be, we forget to unmute yourself. And it is in our power, Elias. Can't hear you, Elias. Say, I can see. I can see him speak, but I can't hear him. I think we we give him another one minute and then I do the thank you. So all of you have seen our vice president. He's the man with the mustache, the books in the background, and the very handsome visage. Since we can't hear him, we'll have to hear me give you an extended vote of thanks and. Uh, I do that, I, I always grasp every opportunity I get. And uh, I think this webinar has been remarkable. It had a huge audience. We are down to about half of what we were, but still so many sticking out for almost three hours or two, two hours and a half is something these days when we are sick and tired. And today was a day of a dozen webinars this morning, six of them by the church including my own diocese. We had two, the ISI competing with the Archdiocese. So you can see how popular the Constitution of India has become. And therefore, it is my present duty and honor again to thank Natasha, Rebecca, Rafael, and the Bishop for helping us understand our own commitment to saving the Constitution. Because if we don't think we have the power to save it, God help us. I thank Nancy de Kuna and the Catholic Union for having such daring webinars. It is no joke to have a webinar where you don't know what people will speak, or John will speak, or what the bishop will speak, or what Rebecca and Natasha will speak. We have never heard them speak in the Catholic Union, and but we go by our feel that they will, if they want to violate the law, do it with a dexterity which doesn't involve all of us as co-accused. But let me assure you, Natasha, if we become co-accused, we will be with you. Thank you, Lancy, for continuing to dare us to have this. Thank you, Rafael, for providing the BCS's munificence to host it for free, to give us the technical assistance with so many people working behind the scenes. Above all, thank you all, each one of you, my dear friends, colleagues, it's always a pleasure to see your faces, to see you involved and engaged. Even when sometimes your mic is open and we can hear dogs barking, your wife asking you if you would have coffee or tea, and somebody else just saying, are we still on that webinar? Thank you so much indeed. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful webinar.